Hello, everyone. Um, my talk is titled Benefits and Risks of Sensing for Emerging IoT Applications. I am Jun Han at uh, the Electrical and Electrical Department in uh, Yonsei University. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I wish this was an offline talk so that I could uh, meet all of you, but uh, I'm really happy to give a talk uh, to the great audience uh, at the uh, SNU. All right, so uh, let me give a very brief introduction of myself as well as my, my lab titled uh, Sci-Fi. And so, uh, like I said, I am currently in uh, the electrical and electronic engineering at Yonsei University. I've been here for about a year now. And before that, I was uh, an assistant professor at the computer science department in the National University of Singapore for about three years. And this is my uh, current and past affiliation. And uh, my lab is titled Cyber Physical Systems and Security Lab, in short, it's sci-fi. And um, we look into various uh, interesting and exciting topics, such as uh, securing sensing systems, as, as well as uh, mobile systems, embedded systems, vehicular systems, and all these uh, emerging uh, technologies. Uh, you know, recently we looked into like drones and uh, truck platoons that we might uh, look into uh, later in, in this part of the talk. All right, so, uh, and, and obviously, uh, this is uh, most importantly my, my students uh, that constitute our lab. Uh, we have students both at uh, the National University of Singapore uh, that I'm remotely advising, as well as uh, students here at Yonsei State University. Okay, so let's uh, move on to today's talk. So traditionally, computing has been dominant in the cyber world. Uh, as you all know, online banking, Facebook, Gmail are great examples of applications in the cyber domain that we enjoy every day. Uh, however, modern computing is now transforming into cyber physical domain, right? This is fortified with the advent of the Internet of Things, IoT, which are network devices with sensors and actuators in various scenarios, such as smart home, office, factories, and vehicles. The overwhelming number of uh, these uh, sensors, along with the AI, helps these devices to make autonomous decisions, which more and more resemble us humans uh, and how we sense and interact or perceive the physical world. Uh, given this trend of transformation, I'd like to, however, pause for a second and pose a question. Uh, and that question is about security. So is the security we have sufficient and adequate enough to cope with this transformation? Uh, well, it turns out that the answer to that obviously is no. And, and so let me try to give you an example, right? So uh, online banking, for example, we're all very familiar with, we probably use it every day. Um, but, um, and then we find that the security is, you know, quite decent, right? So for example, uh, in the authentication issues of such things, uh, the uh, client authenticates the server using TLS SSL by really asking, are you really Bank of America, right? And, the, and the, of course, the bank also performs the client authentication. authentication. Uh, however, um, is this uh, such trend also adequate in the physical world? And it turns out that it is not. And, and why is that? Well, it turns out that the data rely much more on the physical relationships among the parties than identities alone, right? So let me try to give you a quick example of that, right? So here in this example, uh, there are two cars that are driving and this is in the world of near future where the cars are now equipped with B2B communication. So they're communicating over wireless. And it, in, in this case, car M is driving in front of car A on the road. And it turns out that car M is malicious. So car M wants to fool car A into believing that car M is actually behind car A for uh, whatever reason, right? So now here, car M actually sends a message to car A saying, hey, car A, I'm actually behind you. Our, and, and in this case, our, our little poor car A has not, no choice but to actually just accept the fact and say, and just believe that car M is actually behind car A. Um, and you might, you might be thinking, well, couldn't uh, car, uh, couldn't you make the cars, you know, um, include the GPS information and sign that message? But it turns out that digital signatures alone will not help because that's just verifying the identity and the GPS information at best uh, is low in accuracy and it can also be easily spoofed. So the main question that in light of all these uh, you know, problems 
is that we, we need to really verify and bind together the identity as well as the physical relationships and context together. So the main question that I'd like to you know, really ask for the rest of this talk is, how can we teach these IoT devices and CPS to reason and learn about their physical relationships and context, right? And to answer this question, um, we look into the physical world, right? And, and we name this uh, signals of opportunity, right? And this is really nothing but what we call contextual cues from the environment, right? You know, uh, speakers emitting sound, dryers humming, you know, cars driving pot over potholes, light bulb emitting light, all of which can be captured by sensors that are equipped in a lot of these, or if not all of the IoT devices. And these information that are captured by these sensors can then be used to verify physical relationships. And as a teaser to the rest of my talk, sometimes, very interestingly, the traditional notion of noise that I just talked to talked about can actually be used as very useful signal, and you, as you'll see from the rest of my talk. So the rest, so the rest of the talk is really designed under this. This, this main question, how can IoT devices and CPS leverage the sensory perception to first gain security benefits? And also if the attacker gets uh, you know, a hold of this, what can they use that for malicious purposes? And to answer this question, I'll first highlight two exemplary scenarios using the sensor perception. First to demonstrate uh, how we can secure device connectivity in smart homes. And then also to demonstrate an attack on personal privacy in smart homes. And, and, and after that, I'd like to sort of also go over the, uh, you know, sort of more on the overview of the high level of um, the ongoing work as my, and as well as the future direction of my research group. All right. So first, uh, let's go over these two uh, topics first. So uh, without further ado, the first topic is Pairing IoT devices in a smart home. This was a, a work that we published at uh, SNP in 2018. Right, so securing a smart home IoT network becomes a necessity as introducing more IoT devices comes at a cost of potential privacy leakage, as shown in these recent articles and many more, right? And this is because many of the IoT devices are equipped with sensors that monitor users' activities, which potentially contain privacy sensitive information. Uh, hence, it is very important that these devices have an adequate method of establishing trust, right? In other words, setting up a secure channel, which is also known as uh, secure pairing. But secure pairing uh, really has to be protected against men in the middle attacks. And there were many cases where this action didn't hold and caused a lot of problems. So in order to protect against men in the, men in the middle attacks, however, Many of the existing solutions actually require uh, what we call human in the loop solution or user involvement, such as you know typing in password when you're connecting your laptop to Wi-Fi, you, you have to type in password, right? Uh, however, these human in the loop solution of secure pairing is still a long-standing problem because it causes security as well as usability concerns, as you may well be aware of these you know really annoying. Uh, messages like unable to join network, um, pairing unsuccess unsuccessful, and things like that. Well, it turns out I have bad news for you today. As these problems with pairing um, is actually, you know, really an uh, unsolved problem today, it's actually going to get worse. And it's going to get worse uh, specifically with uh, different smart homes and smart offices because uh, there will be, uh, it's projected that the, that the number of devices will you know, increase significantly. So in today's smart home, there are only about tens of devices. So maybe that's manageable. But it turns out that in the future, it's in, in just about, it's projected that maybe in about a few years time, it's going to increase to hundreds of devices. And that actually uh, increased or increased the challenges and mainly in twofold, right? The first challenge is that, um, well, first challenge is that there's too, too many devices, right? And second challenge, is that not only that there are too many devices, uh, all of these devices will not have adequate user interfaces like keyboards and displays. So where are you going to type in the password to begin with, right? So it turns out that uh, this problem motivates the researchers to eliminate the human in the loop solutions and initiate what is called the context-based pairing. So recent research has demonstrated uh, or, or a proposed uh, methods uh, such as the context-based pairing. What is context-based pairing is really a simple idea, 
right? So in this in this house, right, on the bottom right, you see that there are two microphones. Like you can imagine those to be Amazon Alexas, for example, right? And these two microphones inside the same house then can observe or listen to the same random activities, such as the person walking by, doors opening and closing, and whatnot, right? And these common uh, or same randomness, which is also the same entropy, can actually be fed into the cryptographic pairing protocol to ultimately establish a shared symmetric key. So it seems like the problem is solved, right? Um, but it's obviously not, right? Um, and that's because it's actually much more difficult. And it turns out one of the reasons why, why that is difficult is because in a real uh, and practical smart homes, there are so many devices that actually do not share the same sensor types, right? So think about it, right? In your home alone, you have Amazon Alexa that has a microphone, but you may also have a power meter, that, let's say that's connected to a, say a coffee machine that measures the voltages, right? And you may have other things like motion detectors and things like that. So what are you gonna do if all of these devices are actually measuring numerically different results? Um, well, it turns out that uh, it seemingly, it seems like the context-based pairing that I just, just talked about may not work, right? But it turns out that uh, maybe uh, there is still hope because what we found out is there, there are commonalities or what we call invariant properties across these sensors. And what are they? It turns out that it's a timing information. Why? Because numerically, these sensors may be capturing numerically different uh, results, but contextually, they are the same or similar events. So let me give you a very simple analogy. Right, so here, if you put a blindfolded person who cannot see and a person with a speaker who cannot hear the rest of the environment, and you put them in the same room, right, and you open a closed door, what's going to happen is that the two people can then talk to each other and find out that they've actually observed the same event, but just in different ways. That's exactly what we're trying to uh, utilize. So let me give you an intuitive example. Right, so imagine there is a smart home uh, where Bob and Charlie are roommates. And this smart home is now equipped with three sensors, a geophone on the top, which is really the vibration sensor, a microphone like your Amazon Alexa, and the bottom, which is a power meter, let's say again, connected to your favorite coffee machine. Then the raw signals that are depicted here represent the resulting time series signals of each sensor due to the following exemplary scenario. So now Bob, knocks on his roommate Charlie's door like this, and then invites him for a cup of coffee in the living room. Then Charlie uh, opens the door and joins Bob in the living room. They make two cups of coffee and Charlie goes back to his room and shuts his door, right? <laughs> so that's the scenario, okay? So you can see here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, the first set of events is the knocking that I just talked about. The second set is door opening and the last set is the door closing. And the, in the in middle, there are two um, sets of uh, coffee grinding, right? So the bottom line here, the takeaway message of this slide is that the different sensors actually capture these signals, common signals in numerically different manner, but temporally in terms of time, they are observing these things in a very similar time. Okay, so that's a very important point that we're trying to utilize. So to address these aforementioned challenges about this uh, multimodal context-based pairing, we propose Perceptio, which is perception in Latin. And Perceptio enables devices with disparate sensing modalities that, that I just talked about to prove that they are observ observing the similar events over time, gradually building confidence. And these, um, so here's an attacker model that we're looking at. So recall this, this home with different uh, sensing modalities, uh, different devices with different sensing modalities, and we call them legitimate devices because they are owned by the same uh, owner of the house. And now you have an attacker just outside, but cannot go into the house, right? So the attacker brings his device M and places it just outside of the house, but still within the wireless communication range. And the goal of M is to try to fool the devices, the legitimate devices inside the house into believing that M is also inside. But it turns out with our uh, you know, comprehensive experiments that that is actually very difficult because of the low fidelity of information that M can achieve 
from the outside of home. So here's a very high level overview of Perceptio, right? So first, so here I'm gonna give you a very uh, simplified example where we're only looking at microphone, like your Amazon, Amazon Alexa and power meter that's hooked up to your coffee machine. And so at first, uh, each of the devices will send, you know, sense their environments locally and that results in unequal raw signal, right? Because microphone measures it in one way and uh, power meter measures it in another. And then that gets translated into similar fingerprints, which in turn, uh, ultimately we are going to get equal, numerically equal symmetric key, uh, KAB in this case. How we're going to do that is we're going to utilize error correction code based uh, uh, cryptographic key agreement protocol. It's a fuzzy uh, commitment protocol. And the main contribution of our work lies in, in this part where we're going from one to two, which is going translating from unequal raw signal into similar fingerprints. And let's go into a little bit more detail here to give you a high level idea of how this works. So here, this is the local, we call this, uh, you know, the, the example of Bob and Charlie, where and now in this case is the microphone raw data, right? And how we're gonna do this is each device, in this case, the microphone, uh, performs uh, machine learning clustering across the signals uh, according to the event type. So in this case, I'm going to just, for the simplicity of explanation, notate the knocking cluster as star, and then the door opening and closing as the triangle, and then the coffee machine grinding as the diamond, right? Then these devices computes um, then each of the device computes the starting point intervals, in other words, time information of the different events uh, within each cluster to be encoded as the fingerprint bits of each cluster. So here we have the fingerprint from the microphone of the triangle cluster, which is door uh, opening and closing, and then the diamond cluster, which is the coffee machine, right? And that actually gets... Uh, the, and that fingerprint is actually the, the, the translated fingerprint, which will be uh, very similar across different devices, right? So I'm going to uh, skip the details uh, in the interest of time and actually move on to the evaluation. And in the evaluation, we wanted to demonstrate the robustness of perceptive protocol uh, even during the attacker presence. So we wanted to uh, you know, uh, evaluate various parameters, like, you know, different event sensor types, you know, floor types, distance, background, whatnot, right? And so here's an example. So we, what we did is we actually rented out an entire squash board, which actually resemb resembled a smart home and filled up with different sensors. But very importantly, we also uh, brought uh, same type of sensors just outside of the, the squash board as also to, to mimic the attacker devices. So here's our, uh, uh, you know, for graduate students, um, you know, you performing the experiments inside the squash court. And just outside, we also have the same number of devices, except in this case, we also introduced higher quality uh, sensors like, you know, higher quality microphones and higher quality accel accelerometers to try to boost the uh, capability of the attackers. And it turned out that uh, the takeaway points was that pairs inside the, the house yield high fingerprint similarities, whereas the pair inside and outside yield low similarities. So we can adequately distinguish uh, the attack uh, from the legitimate cases. And we also uh, performed uh, various um, experiments, but in the interest of time, I will skip. But um, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask questions. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the second part of the talk, which is actually, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, again in a smart home scenario, but uh, we're going to talk about the risks uh, from sensing too much, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. And this work was published at uh, IPSN, which is uh, one of the top sensing venues um, in sensing systems. And this was in 2017, right? So there's a recent body of work that launches side channel attacks to infer human speech. Uh, using collected sensor data, such as gyroscopes and accelerometers from your smart smartphones. However, uh, all of these prior work uh, are rather limited because they perform uh, mere pattern matching of signatures of small list of hot works, right? So hence, what we wanted to really uh, ask is whether it would be possible to extend this previous work 
uh, to instead of just looking at just a small list of hot words, can we extract all words that are intelligible? In other words, if you play it uh, and you listen with your bare ears, that can be understood by humans without uh, without uh, the need of you know performing machine learning classification. And it turns out that this is actually a very very difficult task, and that is because uh, each of the device uh, in a smart phone is, uh, uh, is actually has a very low sampling rate. So it's, it has sampling rate on the order of hundreds of parts, right? Which is much below Magma's rate. So you cannot get intelligibility. So it turns out that you need at least over five kilohertz of sampling rate to get intelligible speech signal, right? So to put things in perspective for you, uh, telephone and CD samples microphones at uh, eight kilohertz and 44 kilohertz respectively, right? So this is way below. So, so we're trying to go against theory in some sense. What can we do, right? Well, it turns out that we, we look into uh, the possibility of solving this by actually fusing across different uh, non-acoustic sensors to actually reconstruct the intelligible speech signal. So, um, so let's say, let me give you an intuitive example or scenario to demonstrate this idea. So we have uh, the two victim speakers uh, speaking in something privacy sensitive in the, in the comfort of their home on their sofa, uh, you know, at night, for example. And as the victims uh, speak, uh, actually, in front of the victims, there are these on the coffee table. There are these, uh, you know, uh, game controllers and smart TV remotes, which are all equipped with uh, accelerometers, right? And these actually uh, devices, actually, it's not difficult to imagine that these sensor data may be collected in the near future uh, by the manufacturers for user behavior analysis. And if, if uh, the attacker actually breaches the, the manufacturer's cloud, then the attacker may be able to uh, get the raw uh, you know, signals, right? And in this case, as the victims speak, these devices with their sensors capture the speech signal, which the attacker later uses to reconstruct the speech signals. Uh, this scenario demonstrates a strong yet potential case for the attacker, specifically uh, illustrating the practicality of close proximity setup of the sensors and the speakers, right? So uh, let me just try to give you a high level idea of our solution, which we call pitch in. Um, and here, when the victim on the left, victim speaker speaks, sensors one through N, uh, utilizing the same uh, sampling rate of each of each device sampling at a low sampling rate, um, actually uh, tries to pitch in to the overall reconstructed signal, which we call amalgam signal. And the process uh, goes through different modules, such as pre-processing, signal integration, and post-processing. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go into the details in the, for the interest of time, but I uh, invite you to read our paper or ask questions uh, if you're interested. Um, and, the, and let me just try to give you a high-level overview of the evaluation. To demonstrate the proof of concept pitch and attack, uh, we invited 230 participants to, and, and we actually played the reconstructed uh, speech and asked them to transcribe the recordings, right? And when we evaluate it, this was how it looks like. So the y-axis is the accuracy or the transcription accuracy, and the x-axis is the number of uh, sensors that we fuse, right? So the first uh, x-axis is, first point on the x-axis is, uh, you know, we're fusing two uh, geophone, which is a vibration sensor, each sampled at 1,000 hertz. So overall, we get 2,000 hertz. And the second point is we're fusing four sensors to get overall four kilohertz of sampling rate, and we're fusing eight nodes, and we're getting eight kilohertz. And I'd like, I'd actually like to uh, ask your help in um, playing the you know participants of our user study. And let me try to play the sound. Um, see if my sound is working. Okay. So and the, let me let me ask you to guess what word this is it is played. And the hint is it's a number. Okay. All right. So now in the first case, this is uh, you know two, we're, we're fusing two nodes. So overall is two kilohertz. Okay. Any idea what that was? Let me play that one more time. Uh, you can feel free to type in uh, your answers. 
Um, remember, uh, it's like uh, a more interactive uh, uh, talk. All right. Any 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 guesses? Okay. Uh, so the usual contenders are seven. As thanks thanks for the answer. Or some people also guess eleven. Right. Right. So let's try whether you can actually guess this more correct uh, or correctly with a with four notes, right? In this case, it's four notes. We're fusing across four notes to get an overall sampling of 4,000 hertz. Seven. Right, so you can see that it's definitely clear and eight notes. Seven. Right, so you can see that, you know, as you increase the uh, number of notes, it increases the overall sampling rate, which in turn increases the overall transcription accuracy. And actually the same, same trend holds for uh, fusing across different accelerometers and gyroscopes, right? But actually, uh, before I close this part of the talk, I'd actually like to discuss very one very important thing. I mean, of course, eavesdropping, this was all great. But what we really wanted to deliver from this, um, this paper was that um, we wanted to actually propose to the research community that actually all of the related or most of the uh, past work in, in side channel attacks have actually tried to look at uh, uh, exploiting one single device, right? Or one single sensor. But from this work, we what we really wanted to say was that we need to look at uh, defense policies when sensor data can be fused or coordinated by an attacker. So it shows kind of a need for quote unquote room level uh, data protection policy. And, and that's what we really want to deliver from this, this paper, right? Okay, so uh, with that, I'd like to quickly move on to the ongoing research and future directions of my research group, okay? So uh, recall from my uh, earlier part of this talk that uh, all, of, all of this uh, risks, risks and benefits were, uh, you know, were, were actually extracting from the contextual cues from the environment, right? Which which were actually being uh, measured by these sensors. Um, so, it, so what we tried to look at was not only, uh, we tried to look at various risks that we can actually uh, find from this contextual cues. We also looked into security benefits and we're also now slowly branching out to other non-security uh, related problems in the domain of sensing systems, right? So um, to give you a sort of a roadmap of where we are right now, um, in, in terms of the risks, um, we looked into various acoustics-based attacks and we tried to publish, uh, by the way, all of these things we tried to uh, publish and we published at a top venues, a top uh, conference venues in both um, uh, security as well as sensing and mobile systems, right? So uh, in the risks part of things, we looked at, as you've saw, seen, acoustics-based attacks and uh, the, here are the recent publications, uh, including Usenix Security Senses, IPSN, and whatnot. Um, and then also we looked into wireless-based attacks, um, and we also looked at smart home security, right? Then security benefits, we, we looked into secure authentication, uh, as well as physics-guided attack detection, uh, and drone and vehicular security, like the emerging uh, security. So we're trying to branch out to that area as well. And very recently, uh, by the way, uh, so the two two projects that I just talked about um, lie in this space, right? In the box in the red uh, box. Um, and then uh, we're, recently, we're trying to branch out to different sensing systems, which uh, partic doesn't particularly have any security uh, aspect to it, but it's also a very interesting problem. So we're trying to look into healthcare systems um, as well as. Um, uh, accessibility for disabled, geolocation, and food and agricultural sensing. Okay, so uh, let me try to uh, walk you through some of these very interesting talks. Uh, but given the time constraints, I'm going to go over just the high levels of them, right? So think of these as the three thrusts of my uh, group's uh, research directions, right? So the first thrust is the risks from contextual cues. Right, so we just looked into this uh, eavesdropping via motion sensor, motion fusion, right? Um, but uh, we recently uh, we've also looked into very interesting eavesdropping work again, uh, in eavesdropping, but with a very new twist, right? Um, and actually, that was utilizing uh, uh, robot vacuum cleaners. I don't know how many of you own robot vacuum cleaners uh, today in your home. Uh, maybe uh, from from this talk, you might think twice about using your 
robot vacuum cleaners, right? So this work was published as a full paper at Census 2020, um, but we've also presented the, uh, the poster and we won the uh, poster runner award, right? So let me give you a high level uh, description of what this is. It's that uh, it turns out that we can actually repurpose uh, the LiDAR sensor that are equipped in these uh, robot vacuum cleaners uh, to be used as spying devices. So if you take a look here uh, on the top right, this is a robot vacuum cleaner. And on top here is a circular thing, that's a LiDAR. And what it is, is it's actually just a spinning laser uh, you know, transceiver that actually tr transmits uh, and receives the, um, the time of flight information uh, from the laser sensor. Uh, and that's usually used for mapping and navigation for the robots. But it turns out that from our paper, we were able to find that this LiDAR information can actually be used to, uh, you know, you know uh, eavesdrop human speech. And that's by this scenario where let's say a victim is involved in uh, a Zoom meeting and uh, the victim's computer is emitting, you know, privacy speech, sensitive uh, speech like a pin code or password and things like that. And it turns out that because of the speech signal uh, that actually you know, is propagated over the air medium and then minutely vibrates the nearby object like trash cans and shopping bags and things like that. In this case, it's a trash can. And at that point, if the uh, robot vacuum cleaner's LiDAR sensor actually shoots out this uh, laser beam, laser pulse, uh, and it, it is reflected back to the LiDAR. It actually carries very minute and, you know, but, but very noisy uh, speech signal. And if we carefully, carefully process and process that information and run a machine learning, you know, a pipeline on it, we can actually extract the, the speech information. So it, we demonstrated that about, we could actually recover over 90% of the digit and song classifications. And let me just give you a very high level uh, you know, demo video of this. So here is the actual setup of our experiment setup, right? So here's the robot vacuum cleaner. On top, here is the spinning LiDAR. And here's the uh, actual computer speaker with the subwoofer and tweeters. And here's the trash can, okay? And now we're going to play some chirp signal and you will see on this laptop, the raw uh, LiDAR signal. This is the raw LiDAR signal. Now I'm going to play a chirp signal. Can you hear that? Boom, 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 right? As you play that chirp, and the chirp signal is being played by the computer speaker here, you can actually see that the LiDAR is picking that up very interestingly. Now, in addition to just uh, you know, uh, being able to eavesdrop digits, we also play different songs, right? So as you can see here, we're playing, we're going to play a song. Now, this isn't just any song. We're actually playing songs of the introduction songs of uh, you know, news channels, right? And it turns out that different news channels have different introductory songs. And we were able to classify across like 20 different, uh, something like 20 different uh, news programs. And why was that? Because we were actually writing this paper right before the uh, presidential election in the US. And with this, we were able to find the uh, political orientation of the victims, for instance, which can be very privacy uh, sensitive these days, right? So, so this is uh, uh, it was a very cool and fun work, right? And after uh, publishing our work at Census, we we got uh, a lot of traction from uh, different uh, uh, you know news coverage like Forbes um, and even uh, our local Korean news as well. And we won the best poster uh, runner for it. Uh, that accompanied the full paper, right? And uh, moving on very quickly. Um, so here's another uh, acoustic space attack, but this time we're not doing uh, eavesdropping anymore. And this work is actually trying to recover or reconstruct uh, physical keys uh, just from the sound. And this work, the final version was published at last year's using security. Uh, and, the, and the initial version was published at Hot Mobile 2020, right? So, before I actually talk about this, I found something very interesting. Uh, when I when I started at Yonsei and I tried to talk about this this work, um, what I realized was that the students here, uh, you know, now in Korea have never actually 
experienced using um, physical keys in their lives, which was like really surprising for me. Um, but it turns out that that is the case in Korea because we're all using uh, digital door locks. But in the US, Europe, and even in Singapore, uh, physical locks and physical keys are still uh, very much used uh, even today. Right? So attacking this, being able to reconstruct uh, the victim's keys can actually be a significant or, or severe, uh, has, have severe security consequences, right? So what we're trying to do here is that if you take a look on the bottom left here, uh, as the victim is inserting his or her key, physical key into his or her you know, door lock, uh, this makes this droop sound, right? This, this click sounds. And as the attacker who is walking by like a passerby records that sound with his or her uh, smartphone microphone, uh, what we're trying to say is that we, we can actually reconstruct the secrets of this physical key. And the secrets are, are as follows, right? So here there are these 795393. These are the cut depths of these keys. And those cuts are as little as sub millimeters, right? Each, each, each of the depths and each depth can go from zero to nine, right? And so uh, this is actually a very minute um, signal that, that also has very noisy uh, signal because the, as the key gets inserted to the lock, it creates this uh, metal clicking sounds um, and that also in, introduces you know, various noises. So uh, processing this was actually very difficult. And another challenge was that uh, different people uh, actually have different insertion speed. And even across the same person, we have you know, different speed of insertion. So that made it very, very difficult as well. But overall, not going to the details for now, um, we were able to reduce at best up to reduce the space, key space from, from over 60,000 possible keys into just two keys. What that means is that the attacker can only now um, 3D print just two keys and one of them will open the door, right? That's pretty crazy, right, if you think about it. Um, and so the initial, you know, uh, version of the <laughs> setup was very crude. We had various sensors and the keys and we bought like um, various, uh, uh, you know, lock picking tools and watched a lot of those YouTube videos. And here's a sound, by the way, of uh, keys being inserted uh, to the lock. And like I said, uh, we wanted to control the speed of insertion in the initial phase, which was the hot mobile version. So we used the uh, robot's uh, arms to make that consistent. But for the Usenix security, we actually removed that assumption, which made it a whole new uh, problem. We made uh, you know, this uh, mock-up uh, door and tried it with various uh, microphone types as well. Okay, and, and this work after being published was also picked up by communications of the ACM news article, Forbes, and as well as various uh, news article as well, even the local news as well. And through this work, my, my PhD student who was the first author uh, uh, received this uh, um, you know, Google PhD fellowship and she's enjoying her internship right now at Mountain View, California. And another interesting uh, thing about this work is we were very excited that uh, her talk, our talk was uh, actually uh, is still to this day uh, the most uh, viewed uh, SIG mobile uh, YouTube video uh, by far. So uh, I invite you to watch this as well. Um, so we're very grateful for that too. Um, and moving on very quickly, um, we've also been uh, invited to write an article at the communications of ACM CACM magazine. And so we taking these topics together, we, we wrote a, an article about oversensing in smart homes. And this was in collaboration with um, uh, a Professor Kevin Fu at University of Michigan. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the, these details now because uh, of interest of time. Uh, and we've also looked into, uh, you know, finding vulnerabilities of uh, cellular networks as well. And we looked into a couple of uh, topics such as location tracking, as well as uh, video inference, like what videos you're watching over YouTube and you know Netflix, like, like that, just using your cellular networks. And one very interesting thing that, to, to point out is that through this work, oh, by the way, these two works were uh, published at Usenix Security last year. And this year we're going to uh, present that at Ubicom, which is another uh, top venue in sensing and uh, ubiquitous computing. And uh, this Usenix work, 
was also, uh, we were very honored to be uh, uh, listed. And I personally was very honored to be listed as the very first Korean to be listed on the uh, GSMA Mobile Security Hall of Fame, right? So that, that's uh, something that I'm very proud of as well. Okay, so quickly moving on to the next thrust, thrust two, um, which is on the security benefits from this context, right? So I talked about this, um, our Oakland uh, paper, but uh, we also extended that work uh, of context-based pairing to vehicular space, and it has its own challenges, and that was published uh, la at last year's MOVSIS. Um, and so I'm not going to go into the details there. Then moving on quickly um, to the next topic is uh, we actually tried to utilize just smartphone to solve one of the most, uh, one of the biggest, I would say, uh, societal issues today, especially in, here in Korea, which is about uh, detecting hidden cameras, right? Murka detection, right? basically, right? So um, we, what we uh, try to, the, the motivation is as following, right? Here, here's the police officer trying to utilize their uh, detection device that they, they carry. And what they're trying to do is to basically manual. So this is a view from this uh, hidden cam detector, right? And what they're trying to do is manually try to find this, this reflection really um, uh, from this, this view, view uh, finder, right? But turns out that this is a very tedious and difficult task. Why? Because this part is the actual hidden camera, but um, there are so many other reflections, right? This one, this one, this one, this one. And, and you're supposed to squint your eye and try to do this. On top of that, uh, you actually need this device. You need to carry this device. I, like who does that, right? So what we wanted to do was to actually um, find, we asked the question, wouldn't it be cool if uh, we just flip out our smartphone and the smartphone would basically just tell us where the hidden camera is. That's basically our work, right? Uh, so how we're utilizing that without going into too much detail uh, is that we actually tried to use the LiDAR sensors that are also equipped in the smartphone. Remember the robot vacuum cleaner um, work? Well, it turns out that a very similar uh, sensor is now equipped in the modern smartphones. And this is called the time of flight sensors, TOF, used for augmented reality apps like your IKEA apps and things like that. Now, it turns out that as we sh as these devices uh, emit this laser pulse and it, the reflection comes back uh, from this um, TOF sensor uh, by hitting off of different surfaces, uh, it turns out that the the hidden camera lens uh, in, uh, actually exhibits a very minute but sufficiently different reflections, uh, which is actually called retro reflections. Uh, compared to other shiny surfaces like um, door, uh, sorry, uh, glass or mirrors and things like that. Uh, the details, uh, please feel free to check out our paper. We also have very cool demonstration videos and things like that on our website. So I really ask you to look into that. And again, this was also published at Forbes and a lot of other uh, uh, news articles. But what, but what I was really surprised that I'm very um, proud about this is that uh, we found that our work was uh, actually uh, ranked as the most downloaded paper across all years of ACM census publications until present, right? So uh, here's our, our work and, you know, the others are like dating back to 2003. And, and so this was a really cool um, thing. Hopefully uh, in the years to come, this will be most cited, <laughs> uh, but for now it's the most downloaded. And actually what we were really, uh, really surprised actually was that this paper was is, is now currently ranked as top three most downloaded paper across all years of ACM Sigmobile publications. Sigmobile is, uh, you know, as you know, a uh, venue that includes uh, census, mobisys, mobicom, ubicom, and whatnot, right? And so here we're listed here, but when you zoom in, this was pretty crazy that the first paper was actually written by Shannon, uh, in 2001, which actually made that made him the father of information theory, and the second paper was actually written by Mark Weiser, uh, and in 1999, and this paper actually made him the father of ubiquitous what is computing. So we were super uh, surprised and honored that we were actually we've made up to the top three, and hopefully this this will have a lot of citations uh, in in the years to come as well. Okay, so. Uh, 
I'm running out of time. So moving on very quickly to the next one. So this is our very recent paper um, that we published at Movis just a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we, we also presented the poster that accompanied our, accompanied our full paper and uh, also won the best, po best poster award here. So the idea is very simple, right? The idea is that it turns out that there are many um, uh, fake alcohols and fake liquors like fake olive oils and things like that. And it turns out that people actually die by drinking some of these uh, lethal uh, fake uh, liquids. So the question is, can we actually use your smartphone uh, without without opening the bottle um, to find out it, whether this, um, this this liquid is actually authentic. And so the idea is, uh, well, we found at, at first, you know, I thought this was a super difficult and impossible problem, but, but it turns out that it is possible. And the idea behind that is uh, that as you flip a bottle, uh, the the, the, you, you can actually observe the bubbles that form inside the, the liquid bottle. And if you actually take a slow motion video such as this and process that, uh, you can actually uh, get sufficient information or infer the liquid properties, which in turn you can actually infer the liquid authenticity. And again, this is, uh, we're very honored to get the po best poster award that accompanied the full paper. Um, and uh, this is um, uh, our, one of the most recent work. This is still under revision, but we very recently received a revised decision. So hopefully this will be uh, some, uh, accepted at CCS. This is trying to utilize um, uh, EM leakage uh, from your laptops to identify uh, microphone eavesdrop e eavesdropping detection. So uh, very quickly, uh, what we're trying to find out is that uh, you know, there are various remote privacy attacks by malwares and laptops, right? Like, so for example, webcams uh, may be secretly stealthily taking your video images and microphones may be secretly eavesdropping your speech. And what we wanted to find out was, can we actually detect such um, uh, microphone uh, stealthy activities uh, by just using a, a very simple probe that is, uh, you know, uh, attached outside of your laptop and it turns out that it's possible because as you turn on the microphone, we found that uh, these uh, EM signals are being leaked and that's leaked because uh, the, the digital MEMS microphones inside the laptops actually takes in uh, uh, you know, clock signals for its ADC. And so when you actually start the microphone, uh, this roughly around two megahertz uh, of, of leakage actually occurs. And as soon as you stop the recording, uh, it magically disappears. And this was really cool. And it's because of various uh, physical factors such as uh, your flex uh, cable being connected to the connector or your flex cable bending or your microphone sharing the common ground with different peripherals in your, in your laptops. And so we're in, in, currently this is our current prototype, but uh, we're envisioning that this can be shrunk to a small uh, ideal form factor like this very synonymous to your plastic cover that covers your uh, webcam, right? Very similar to that. And um, so uh, we tested across 30 different laptops of various make and model. And we found that this actually works across uh, mo most, if not all of these devices, right? So uh, that's that work. And I'm going to skip over this, this uh, uh, you know, a couple of the work on drones and, um, uh, you know, semi-autonomous trucking because of time. I'll move on to the third thrust very quickly. And this is uh, actually, um, I'm trying to branch out to non-security uh, venues uh, or topics as well. In this case is the uh, healthcare sensing systems. Uh, and uh, the first one, um, when I was back at NUS, we, we wrote a grant uh, about uh, utilizing earables as sensing platform for health monitoring. And we received a, a research grant from the Singaporean Ministry of Education. And I was a principal investigator there. And that sort of led to our very initial set of work um, in, in recent uh, publications. Uh, and very recently, this was super recent. Uh, we also, now that I'm here in Korea, we wrote a grant together with uh, Asan Medical Center, and we, uh, we recently got a grant uh, from the Korean Ministry of Health and Welfare uh, to try to monitor a severity specific psych psychiatric ward in Asan uh, 
uh, hospital, right? So that's something that I'm looking very much forward to in future, in, in the near future as well. So uh, that sort of wraps up my uh, sort of talk for today. And uh, we have many more other projects that are uh, ongoing right now, other than the ones that I introduced to you. Um, so if you're interested, uh, I'm very open to collaboration. So please feel free to reach out to me uh, with these emails and check out our lab uh, website as well. Uh, thank you so much. 네, 감사합니다.